are going to have some closing remarks from Dr. Steve Schoenbaum, who is the special advisor to the president of the Josiah Macy Jr. Foundation. Thanks. That's the kind of title you get when you get old. Uh, okay, so I've been uh, creating some slides as the day went on, so you don't have them. Uh, I don't know whether that gets updated at some point on the website, because they now exist. And with luck, I will figure out how to get through them. So, and since I have to, oh, there we go. Um, I, I thought I would just make some remarks that reinforce some of the messages you've been hearing, but that I also, since you've been listening and you've been hearing just like I have and thinking, thought I'd try to introduce something new as well, um, but related. The, we've heard, I think, uh, that competence of health professionals is an old issue it's also a central issue. It's what patients expect. We expect it as patients, and these days my contacts with the health system are primarily as a patient. Um, and so I really have a personal interest in this, in this subject. Um, the, and I'd like to reinforce the notion that the continuum isn't three or four years, which Steve Abramson brought up in his opening comments. It actually isn't just training long in this traditional sense we think of as training. It's career long. And uh, that's going to be part of where I'm going with the idea I want to introduce. Uh, we've heard some about time independence and its important linking. We had a Macy conference, one of these working conferences, uh, back in June. Some of you were there uh, and participating in it. And uh, the notion of time independence came up very broadly. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean shortening. Sometimes, as I think George Mexicano pointed out, it can mean lengthening. But it also can mean offering opportunities for enrichment. If you have somebody who achieves whatever is the desired usual level of competence, then conceivably you can offer other opportunities to go beyond that um, and develop real expertise. Oops. There. Um, we heard from uh, Dr. Pangaro that, and he gave us a definition, that professionalism is a promise of duty and a promise of expertise. Uh, since it was based on the work of uh, Edmund Pellegrino, I assume he was referring generally to professionalism, uh, since he was not a physician, I believe. He was an internist. He was an internist. Ah, oh, sorry. And, uh, today has been about how we get to be professionals and how we know that we are professionals. Um, but I want to keep planting this idea, and it's embodied in this last point, that professional is not an end point. It's something that one keeps developing. And I like the analogy of thinking of medicine and the health professions as performing arts. And I think you can use that notion quite broadly. What's, what are the key elements of a performing art? And you can think about whatever model you want, whether it's dancing or, uh, or could be being uh, in theater or could be, frankly, I would include sports as a performing art, and they include, all of these include cognitive skills, technical skill, and knowledge. And they're in different ingredients, different proportion uh, in the different performing arts. I think that we have it backwards in our health professions education, and particularly in medical education in that we've traditionally put the emphasis on knowledge. 
We've put a secondary emphasis, but only really a secondary one on technical skills. Um, and we've put a tertiary emphasis on cognitive skills. And I think that, in fact, we need to start thinking about how are we going to turn this around? And particularly if you think about what's happening in the world where the knowledge keeps changing and it's best accessed uh, through ways of getting to whatever is the most recent compilation, the technical skills uh, fortunately can now be increased through use of simulation and task trainers. Uh, and the cognitive skills, which are going to have a lot to do with our interactions with patients, are going to become, if they aren't already, of prime importance. So I think there's a lot that we can learn, both from individual performing arts and uh, artists. We aren't quite the same as any one of them, any one of those other performing arts. Um, we can learn both from individual performers and from group performers. Performers such as the ones in the lower left uh, who are in a jazz combo or a jazz orchestra um, have to know how to improvise. They also have to know how to play together as a team. So these are aspects we know that occur in medicine. How different is that from what we expect surgeons to do in the OR. So I hope I've planted this notion of a little bit of reframing, but also that it relates to virtually everything we've been talking about today. Um, I, I will be a little more explicit about some elements of the performing arts. They include listening and understanding. Talk to a jazz musician about what kind of listening it takes in order to play with other people. Um, connecting through the body and language, uh, something that, that is done consummately in the, um, in, in the performing arts. Not only improvisation, but the ability to recover when things go awry, um, which we don't always learn. We just sort of drop things. Uh, deliberate practice. This is a key concept in the performing arts. Uh, and it's been popularized uh, by a number of, of common books now, like uh, there's one called uh, Talent is Overrated. Uh, they all tend to talk about uh, Professor Erickson at Florida State University, who's known for the 10,000 hours of practice, except that he would be the first to point out to you that that's not really what the data showed. What the data showed was that you have to, had to practice deliberately and that it took a lot of deliberate practice before you could develop the expertise that really outstanding performers have. Um, it requires coaching and feedback and ability to set one's own goals. Um, and uh, Eric Holmbo had mentioned the idea of lifelong curriculum and assessment. This is what performers do. They are, if, if you start reading what, what really star performers say, they say, that I all know I could always have done better. It's remarkable. I mean, we think they're doing unbelievable things as it is, and yet they're motivated to keep working on uh, some elements of their performance with both a sense of the need to improve continuously and that they are continuously accountable for their performance. Oh, my extra credit question. Um, I once was discussing this uh, with the dean of uh, School of the Performing Arts. And she said, do you know which performers get the most and the most immediate feedback? Anyone have an idea? No, I think I heard it. It's comedians. 
right? They, they know almost every minute to minute whether what they're saying <laughs> works. Um, we don't have that. We have encounters with, with patients and we haven't really a clue what it is that they heard, what they didn't hear. There are studies showing they didn't hear what we think we said, et cetera. Um, okay. I couldn't resist that notion of an extra credit question in the <laughs> midst of this. Um, the patient is both part of the uh, thing that makes this performing art very difficult and extremely interesting. It's part of why we don't have quite an analogy to other kinds of performing arts. Because uh, the patient has to be another performer in this, unless we're talking about unconscious patients or anesthetized patients. Uh, and the patient has expertise in what they feel and experience. But they also needed to be brought into the performance. And that's our responsibility. I saw yesterday in the paper that Michael Moore and his new uh, one, one person or one man show, in his instance, uh, is going to bring people on stage. He's particularly looking for ones who might disagree with him and that he wants them to be able to express what it is that they think and re have a, an interaction with him. I think it's fascinating to know how he's going to do that. Uh, because that's not normally what happens on stage. Normally, if there's somebody from the audience, it's just as a stooge. Patients are not stooges. I could be quoted on that, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, so th the other thing is that the patient may be a performer, but the patient's also an audience. Unfortunately, we often don't get really um, good feedback from our patients, there's a power relationship. It makes it difficult. Um, I don't know how many of us in being patients have felt that. I know a number of professionals who say, I was afraid to raise X, Y, or Z with my doctor. Um, this also occurs with nurses. People fear retribution when they're in the hospital and have some interaction with the nurse. Here's an anonymous maxim. An amateur practices until he can get it right. A professional practices until he can't get it wrong. What percentage of physicians do you think have anywhere near that goal in mind? Um, I think it's pretty low. It, I hate to say it, but I think in the days when I was practicing, I wasn't thinking about these issues actively. So I would argue that we are performing artists, but we're not expert performers. We could be. We need to be. Can everybody be a star? Um, well, in a funny way, the answer is yes. Not everyone will be as bright a star as others. And even the bright stars, you have to make sure that they're not supernovas, you know, in the, in the process of imploding or whatever. But the fact is that we all need uh, to think that we could be stars. And the public, I hate to say it, expects that we actually are. Um, you know that old joke as well or better than I do about, you know, what do you call the person who was last in their class? And the answer is doctor. Um, so, in fact, we have to be sure that those people have met a very high standard of performance. I want to say a word about competence-based education and interprofessional education. You can't be from the Macy Foundation and not say a word about it. Um, I think that there are some important underlying questions that this whole discussion raises. And, there, and one of them is what are the essential roles or competences of physicians? Another is what is the essential roles or competences of other health professions, pro professionals. And 
you, you don't expect me either to actually give you the answers. Um, but the fact is that many health professions, as we speak, are working on competence-based education. And I think that that will help define what these roles are. I've been asking this question for some years now, and I don't get answers. Um, people can't tell me exactly what they think we need a physician for and what it is that somebody else could do because they could be as competent as we can in that area. Um, and I think that ultimately this is going to be very useful for workforce planning and for stimulating better teamwork once we start thinking about what is it that all the professions can do both individually and together. Um, Dr. Pangaro said uh, a number of things that I'd been thinking about for some time, and I put at the bottom of this that uh, something like almost 25 years ago, I wrote an editorial for JAMA called Toward Fewer Procedures and Better Outcomes. And it was really about collecting evidence that was useful for, in this instance, appropriateness of various procedures. Um, and the fact that it could only occur with epidemiologic studies. Now you have to realize that I was once trained as one. Uh, but in fact, through uh, observational data. Um, and the reason is that we can't collect it all through RCTs. Uh, they're too expensive. There are too many exclusions. And too many of our patients don't fit that. And so, in fact, in order to generate better knowledge, uh, and I also saw it being talked about for medical education by Mark, uh, where he was using an epidemiologic approach, you need big data. And the big data aren't going to be simple. It's nice to have them sitting in a database like the one that Mark used. But some of the ones we're going to need, we're going to need to get better information about outcomes and information that's standardized in the way we think about it so that, in fact, we can determine if patient X has Y conditions and Z interventions, what is the probability that they are doing well at certain lengths of time? I think that's one standard form of the question. And so we'll need large clinical databases and the outcomes. We also need more user-friendly and better standardized health information technology, which has, I think, been um, our first national disgrace was being late in implementing it. Our second uh, has been in implementing some things that are really not user friendly. Um, so with that, um, you've survived my closing remarks. And I wanted to uh, close on very positive notes. For, first of all, on behalf of George Tebow and the Macy Foundation, um, we want to thank you all, and uh, particularly to Steve Abramson and Joan Cangerella and their staff who've made this day possible, to all of the speakers who I found very stimulating, and to all who've attended and been thinking and hopefully rethinking um, what we're doing. And I will truly close. Uh, with the notion that uh, this is the end of the program uh, and that I'm almost done. But, and, and you can ask yourself actually whether that's a sunset or a sunrise that you have, you're going to head off into. It's actually a sunset. Uh, and I'm going to head there, but not till tomorrow night. And, um, think about what it is that you can do next to forward this agenda. And with that, thank you all and have a great afternoon.